Welcome to IT in Motion, the podcast where we make technology exciting, interesting, and informative. I'm Josh. And I'm Patrick. We're your host today, and we're joined by Sarah Leslie, the manager and lead of the new science logic community, Nexus. Give it up for Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you on today. Just tell us briefly a little bit about yourself so that folks know who you are. Well, um, I'm a community manager by trade. Um, I absolutely love uh, working with online communities and helping companies realize uh, so many benefits from this type of engagement. Um, and I'm really excited to be working with the Science Logic uh, Nexus community. We just launched in April and we've just got a lot of great activity and um, customer engagement already. Well, we're really excited to get to know you, have our listeners and viewers get to know you. Um, and as part of that, we like to do, as you know, a, a little bit of a game. Uh, so you are a race car driver. Uh, and what we'd <laughs> like to do is just ask you a few questions about that to, so people can get to know kind of the personal side of you. So uh, first question, what is your favorite racetrack and why? Oh, gosh. Um, I've been to quite a few racetracks, but only here in California. So in terms of asphalt, uh, my favorite is uh, Laguna Seca. It's a very technical track. Uh, the corkscrew is um, just an unbelievable turn where if you're not 100% at the right angle and you know where your car is going to land, um, you can get yourself in trouble really quickly. In terms of uh, dirt tracks, um, I have to say my favorite's uh, my home track, which is Watsonville, California. So if you were to pick a, a character from the movie Cars for yourself, which character would it be? Oh, my gosh. Um, I, d I don't know the names of the characters. Uh, probably one of the ones that um, tried new things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Uh, what racing accomplishment are you most proud of? I am the most proud of the last race um, of the season um, at, at Antioch in 2013. I was on the way to the track. I was hauling my car and I got a flat tire. So I had on the trailer, which uh, I don't know if you've experienced that, but you know, it's not, it's not what you expect. You're driving and then all of a sudden you feel a bump and then it gets louder and louder and and more disruptive. And so I pulled over, uh, had to, and I was by myself. There were other people um, in my group that were traveling, but they were slightly behind me. So um, they pulled up, helped me change the tire. We got to the racetrack. Um, this was a really important race because I was the points leader. Um, and there were a bunch of folks that that was their home track. They didn't want me to win. And so uh, we'd heard in advance that they were bringing a number of other folks from other tracks to uh, take me out so I wouldn't be able to win. And um, so I had a whole kind of entourage of people that came from my track to to help kind of guard me and support me. And uh, oh, my gosh, it was a nail biter all the way to the end. And uh, there was like a technical thing. So they pulled me off. And uh, I think in, there was an ulterior motive in hopes that I wouldn't win. And uh, I got back on the track and I literally uh, passed the right person at the very last moment before the checkered flag, like a quarter of the way through the last lap. So if I had not um, passed at that time, I wouldn't have won and I wouldn't have won the season. Wait. Wow. <laughs> and you're not and you're not kidding about actually racing. And here, if you don't mind, we're going to pull up a, a photo of it, um, uh, of you and your race car here at one point. This is just amazing. I mean, this is this is not just a little bit of racing. This is like the real deal. And so, um, you know, when you talk about racing, um, just remember, you know, the context here, uh, you know, you're really, really serious about this. Um, so, for example, like what's the what's the wildest thing that you ever had happen, you know, during a race? Oh, uh, well, on asphalt, I would say um, things happen really quickly. So you have to adjust your, you have to get used to things happening so fast that you have to react very quickly to avoid situations. So I've seen people like crash right in front of me mid turn and you're, you have to just immediately figure out which way do I go to avoid that. Um, on the dirt track, um, absolutely. Um, you know, you can turn someone if you want to get them out of the way. 
So I've had someone turn me so hard that it, it pushed me up above the asphalt wall into the, um, the, the, the chain link fence. And my car was literally hanging off the side of it. So, um, that one was a call to the chiropractor the second I got out of the car. <laughs> Jeez. So. You've been involved, you know, with user community for a long time now, a lot, uh, you know, several Ooh. different communities in technology. So how did you go from, um, you know, first of all, how did you sort of get your start um, in in uh, working with communities and then technology? And then essentially, how do you go from being an actual race, you know, you know part time, fairly serious race car driver to actually mm -hmm. leading a community and really facilitating the interaction and connection of folks uh, in technology? Yeah, it's funny because you think one is very competitive and one is very inclusive. Um, and so, you know, in my personal life, I've always been a tomboy. I, I just like to go out and, and do things and experience life as much as I can. Um, and, and when I was thinking about my career goals when I was younger, I, I wanted to travel. Um, I've always been fascinated with um, other cultures and how people do business and solve problems. So I started my career in um, international uh, business with uh, like project management for uh, global websites and uh, transitioned into a role where I was asked to launch an online community. And um, oh my gosh, a couple of weeks in, you know, I was working with all these talented people in, in this very large organization. We're like, how do we how do we um, make sure that we are optimizing our resources and our platform and our experience for the company and for our customers? And uh, like a couple of weeks in, and I just, I never turned back. I was like, this is where I want to be. It's an absolutely amazing dynamic experience um, to uh, help customers in so many ways and have this type of dialogue uh, where you're solving problems and you're getting real time feedback that you can bring back to your organization and your leadership and say, Hey, like we need to fix this for this person. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what are some of the more meaningful experiences you've had in that whole, you know, community interaction process? I know you must've talked to just dozens of or hundreds of people in different scenarios, circumstances. Yeah. <clears throat> Over my, uh, 20 year span of managing online communities. My focus has been uh, B2B tech communities. And I had one in particular that was uh, really exciting and engaging. Like the customers really loved the product. And um, in, in one situation, we had a, an expert whose uh, screen name was Clever. And uh, he was relatively new to the community and uh, was jumping in and, and, you know, solving some really complex problems, but also asking a lot of questions. And he had a situation where uh, he responded in a way that some of the other community folks like kind of jumped on him and, and were um, saying, hey, you know, you're not so clever, are you? And, and of course I, you know, as a community manager, I, I see this whole environment as, you know, my responsibility to make sure that everyone is safe and, and contributing and getting value. So I jumped in immediately and reached out to him and I had not spoken with him one-to-one uh, -one beforehand. And it, it became clear very quickly that he was in South America and he was using a translator tool for all of his posts. And so uh, the lesson in that is you never know who you're speaking with or what 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 part of their journey in a community and as an expert that they are, you know, what what area they're in um, and what type of obstacles they're dealing with uh, to participate. And in this case, uh, it was just a, a translator tool. And he went on to become one of our top contributors and one of our MVPs. Um, and is still very active in that community. Um, I maintain a relationship with him on LinkedIn. And uh, I'm just so happy to see as his career has continued to, to move ahead. Um, so in particular, seeing how uh, the community experience can turn around a customer's, um, a customer's journey uh, and, and help them be successful with the product is, is outstanding. So the, the human aspect of that is really what, what seems to, you know, attract you to that, that it's mm -hmm. not just documentation or a help desk or something else, but like there is an opportunity to really, um, 
participate in the development of people, the development not just just of the community, but the the people within it, and to and to see them actually succeed. So you know, for folks who maybe aren't thinking about you know kind of why community is important, this in this you know uh, distinctively from maybe some of the other ways that you might interact with a company, right? Like just lots and lots of documentation or or something else. Like what really does set community apart? Why is it why is it particularly important to the human beings that are interacting with technology? Yeah. I think that a community is a unique experience. Um, it's it's multidimensional, um, and so if you think about a website, it's it's such an important aspect of a business and a relationship with customers and potentials. Um, but it it's a more of a one way type of communication, um, and then you have you know all these other emerging channels which are outstanding. I mean, look at what social media has done in terms of engagement. But it is, in my opinion, more of a push relationship um, or an accept if there's an emergency kind of thing. Um, online communities are this progression of uh, building relationships with your customers, um, fostering um, expertise, and just this ability to see all of the different ways that you can impact and benefit not only your customer companies, but your customer participants. Um, and as you alluded to, Patrick, um, at, with their expertise, as they continue to grow as professionals and they've chosen to work with your product in, in some capacity. So to help them be successful with the product, um, many times uh, people include their online communities as part of their uh, portfolio um, and, and, and present that as, as ways that they solve problems and in different aspects of their expertise. Yes, there's a real give and take with uh, with the community, and and you know if you can encourage the people to give and and you know something they're going to get something back out of it, and you know, your whole customer base is has a richer experience as a result of that. Um, what do you think are the most important factors in in sort of making that happen? Right, we I think there's a lot of companies out there who'd like to build the community who don't know where to start, don't know how to do it. How how do they go about doing that? I think it's important to always look to solve problems. Um, and so, you know, if you are looking to launch an online community, what is it that you're looking to resolve for your organization, for your customers, for your partners, for your business model, um, and, and understand how the community fits into that larger uh, business plan um, and, and that you're looking to solve problems for your customers as well. Um, there are just so many different benefits uh, to your your whole ecosystem with so many different folks that you don't even necessarily know that you're going to be able to engage with the community. So step one is kind of to decide you want to do it. Step two is to mm -hmm. figure out how it fits in the bigger picture. And then at that point, I guess you start looking at platforms that sort of meet that need. And then there's, I imagine... You know, in your mind, you've it's it's maybe a, not something you even write down, but in your mind, you've got a, a sort of go forward strategy from that point where, OK, we've got the platform, we've got the people, we're going to start rolling it out. Can you talk a little bit about what that go forward strategy is? Sure. So in terms of um, yeah, technology platform is a critical uh, piece of, of, of the picture moving forward, it there are a number of different platforms that are available out there, and it really depends on what um, the needs are for the organization. Budget is a, is a big factor, but also the needs and experience for your for your user base. Like, what what do they need to accomplish? And in this capacity, um, B two C versus B two B communities are are very different. Um, that the type of experience and collaboration and features and experience expertise that you need from your internal internal resources as well can be uh, very different. So uh, yes, absolutely. Selecting your platform, understand and understanding what the needs are, um, and then going through uh, mapping out what your um, your goals are, your KPIs, um, and then making sure that you understand what the timeline is. You know, sometimes companies have, you know, urgent um, events or product launches or or things on their on their calendar or their planning uh, in maybe immediate or long term that they want to map out that community launch to align with. 
Yeah. Do you find that you sort of start in that process? Uh, it's helpful to just literally get on a meeting and talk to some potential users, like to sort of pre-community what will be the community to figure out what they want and what their interests are and, and how to make sure that it's going to be really interesting and useful to them? Absolutely. Um, if you think about a successful community, listening is one of the most important things uh, to make sure that you that you plan things out correctly from the beginning, but throughout that whole process, um, whether it's internal or external, um, making sure that you have a, you know, you're available in as many ways as possible to um, allow people to share their feedback and be very genuine um, and, and that they know that they can trust you and that you're gonna take whatever it is that they're sharing uh, back to leadership, back to stakeholders um, and, and try to help resolve uh, whatever, whatever that um, request is. So if you get a so once you get a community started, right? And I think we've all been members of communities at one time or another that sort of went through different phases of their 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 existence, their life because they really are living entities once you know once a lot of people start getting involved. Mm-hmm. How do you measure the health of that community over time, right? Cuz I, I to to make sure that not only is it connecting people, but that it is continuing to evolve in ways that are really interesting and organic for that community. Yeah. I think that there are uh, so many different factors there in terms of um, community health. Uh, It it also depends on the perspective. So from the executive standpoint, um, they typically want to see that that there's growth. You know, how many visitors are there? Um, How many members? You know, you're always looking for positive movement forward uh, that's in alignment with your customer base and also you know, there's always, uh, I mean, to get into, you know, more of the details, um, reducing churn and making sure that mm-hmm. you are uh, driving people towards the right products that are that are helpful for them and that you're giving them um, the necessary um, information. Um, so executives want to see that that's meeting uh, the needs of the organization and customers. But then from the stakeholder teams, uh, product Product teams versus support organization um, all have um, different uh, needs and goals that align to their, um, you know, their organization and the things that they're executing on. Um, and then as the community manager, I'm always looking to convert uh, visitors to registered members, to participating members, to um, experts and evangelists that not only uh, participate actively in the community, but um, also will participate in in other forums, whether it's a social media channel or um, another community, to advocate for you, to advocate for your products. Um, and so those are those are also important factors. So it's interesting, you know, you're you're mentioning uh, making sure that the sponsors of the platform are finding it to be useful, right? To make sure that they maintain their their sponsorship of it. But I think you know one of the great things about communities is is um, the sense of it's a little bit underground, like the individual members and the way that we communicate, you know, one-on-one is one of the great things that's a part of that, a part of most communities. So assuming that, you know, the sponsor is really enjoying the, the, the um, interaction, especially, you know, sort of it's a giant northbound API, right. For a chance to sort of speak to users of, of products or, or, or services, but within the community of itself, sort of the hands-on day to day, like, how do you how do you keep it healthy from a human perspective? Like you're watching it, you're watching a lot of different threads, a lot of different topics, and you have a sense for sort of how it's actually evolving outside of outside of its sponsorship, like this the, the 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 users themselves. How do you how do you how do you keep them healthy? How do you make sure that it's interesting for them uh, individually? Yeah. So I think planning and consistency are mm-hmm. important factors. Um, You always want to make sure that you have a good editorial calendar, that you are providing fresh and valuable content for members um, that's engaging, that you go back and you measure to, um, you know, what content is um, getting the most activity, what are people finding the most useful, um, and make make sure that you try to um, replicate the things that work as much as as much as you can. Um, Also, um, (laughs) you know, when I'm First thing I do in the morning is I log into the moderation queue and I look at new members and um, I just love all of the different, um, seeing the different companies, seeing the different screen names, 
seeing how people um, onboard with the experience um, and, and seeing some of the first questions that they ask. Um, I, I find it um, also very exciting when when other community members jump in and and like start to help each other. And we're already seeing that in this in the Nexus community. And we're only like two months in, which is um, really exciting um, to see. But that that growth as people transition, you know, there are um, visible indicators um, as they're going through this adoption process. Like you know, when they first log in, uh, then when they start to post questions and become engaged and you see that they've acquired more badges through gamification and they're starting to acquire more points. Um, they take they take the time to update their profile to add an avatar. Um, that's usually a, an indicator that you've developed strong ties with that uh, community member. Um, and then when you see these consistencies with 30, 60, 90 day logins, um, and then you see people following content um, and then uh, messaging you directly if they need assistance with something or sharing their feedback. I think, um, you know, back to that transition, a lot of community members at first tend to be lurkers where they are, um, you know, absorbing information and watching. And then once they start to feel comfortable, then they start to participate by asking a question, which is showing a level of vulnerability, actually, um, especially, you know, amongst their peers. So people want to be seen as an expert. And so to, to show that they don't understand something or they need help is um, an important piece of that journey. So. It's, it's an interesting way of describing that, right? You're really talking about kindness, right? Toward, yeah. toward the other members, but that idea of shepherding and looking for footprints, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of watching what they do, thinking of thinking of their development from the first moment that they join and letting them really guide the experience, not only for themselves, but for others, and just really have an awareness of how they're doing within the community and, and not just, you know, running reports, but like treating each, each member of that community as an individual. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I, I try to just be um, open and helpful. Uh, with everyone I encounter and make sure that I um, assist them with their individual needs. And I have, I mean, you say an open door policy, but like I, I put my email out there. I, I tell people, you, you know, you want to like be a messenger. Typically, like if you want to get on a phone call, let's talk through this. Let me, you know, help you get to the right person to solve your problem. Yeah. That, that whole idea of psychological safety. Um, you know, if you ask a question, no one's going to come in, you know, yell your head off or anything, something you, you've touched on a few times. And I think, you know, that is such an important piece of growing any kind of community, whether it's an online community or an in-person community. If people don't feel like they can show up and talk, they're not going to want to show up and talk, right? And it, it all kind of languish. So I think that's, a you know, an, an incredibly important part of of growing like the culture of a community, right? From the very beginning as it as it grows over time. Um, for people who are starting out, I bet you've got some really good advice. Like, uh, you know, to call earlier this week, you actually gave some great advice I'd never thought about before. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't mind, I'll share it here, which is when you're sure. early on in forming community like Nexus, you don't want to have too many categories because it all gets spread out. And I think the way you you said it, it's like having a big party, but there's a lot of rooms and there's just two people in each room. And so no one gets to know each other. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to expand on that or, you know, kind of talk about some of those other ideas that are helpful for people kind of getting started building their community. Yeah. So um, it is very important and that there is a strategy behind how you want to um, drive engagement from the beginning. So with Nexus, this is a almost a net new community. Um, you know, we, we have a great customer base. They've been asking for this type of experience um, and, we were absolutely very deliberate in um, launching the community with uh, very limited discussion forums so that we can keep all, all the folks in the same room, so to speak, um, so that they start to um, have discussions, feel like there's um, you know a, a group of, of folks with, with shared goals and interests. Um, and then as, as we um, encourage participation and people drive those uh, those uh, close ties to the community, then uh, we we watch the trends, like what types of um, topics, tags, categories, um, 
uh, product areas are people the most interested in? You know, what, what do we have the most discussions around? And then um, launch new areas, programs, content, et cetera, based off of uh, what those users need. So very, very important. And this um, social element behind it is, is very uh, prominent in, in the decision making um, to make sure that we uh, use the right functionality and that we package things in ways that's meaningful. And I've seen content that uh, teams have gone back and said, gosh, you know, I really thought that customers were going to like this and they, you know, but we don't have anyone downloading this or we don't have anyone commenting. Um, and so sometimes we'll take, we'll go back and look at it and go, well, you know, I think it's the packaging, it's a categorization or, or the title or something that's not meaningful. So how do we, how do we, um, update this? So the story in that is it doesn't always mean that the content itself is not valuable. It's just that way, the way that we're presenting it, sometimes we have to go back because we're listening, uh, to our users, um, and, and update things. Yeah. You have to learn. To... It sounds like you're saying that if you're, if you're interacting, right. And you, you, you said content, but like really useful information that you're able to, you know, really share as a part of a community that maybe isn't, isn't more typical sort of down at, at users. Um, how do you, uh, what's the best way of going about connecting, um, the opportunity of interacting with that, that, uh, content. And what I mean by that is to me, community offers a disproportionate opportunity to have an influence on a company, right? Mm -hmm. Like companies that are really using their, um, that are using their communities to really connect to, to users are paying, as you mentioned before, paying pretty close attention to how that content is being used, what works really well, and then doing more of it. So mm -hmm. are you suggesting that by interacting with the community and especially commenting and taking a look at content that's available there does really give users a chance to sort of uh, at least uh, wag the tail on a company to really help guide them to something that's, that's particularly useful for them? Absolutely. Um, and I would say that... Um, Community is valuable to folks at all stages of the customer journey. So uh, it used to be that people would just go to a website to learn about a company and, and maybe download some documentation or marketing materials. Now, part of that initial evaluation process is to go to the community and see what is the sentiment like? Do customers get what they need? Um, is, is the company receptive? Is the content valuable? Um, and so having a uh, community like Nexus, which is a hybrid model where you have a percentage of the content and um, engagement open to the public is important, even at just this very, very early stage of the process. But as you continue through the customer journey, uh, when uh, people have decided that they are going to um, use your products and or services, um, and they are onboarding and looking to um, implement and be successful and learn. Um, they leverage the community for that as well to augment um, whatever certification and training processes are available. And then all the way through through um, the support aspect of, hey, you know, like I've done this, uh, but it wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Um, what did, what do other customers do? Uh, what have you done? And so not always just getting the official response from the company, but from their peers to learn about creative ways to um, implement things, to use different tools in ways that, that best meet their needs. Uh, but then all the way up to um, our partners, uh, people that choose to, um, to work with us to um, uh, share or sell our products or augment uh, what our offerings are. Um, and then developers as well. Yeah, it really kind of comes back to a lot of the things you're saying about establishing the culture, uh, determining what you want to do, and you know, mm -hmm. figuring out things like what's public, what's private, what's uh, you know, what's going to be interactive, and what's going to be something that the company produces for the for consumption, right? You know, like blog posts or knowledge base articles versus open forums. Um, do you have any advice for people who are thinking through those sort of things? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> definitely have as much structure as possible. Try to be organic uh, when it comes to uh, leading people uh, towards the things that they're 
naturally inclined to do and participate in. And so I, I'm, I'm specifically addressing um, the external audiences, but also internally as, I mean, this is, it's a, it's a big change for an organization to launch a community and to grow a community. And um, one of the biggest challenges that, um, that companies experience is getting that, that good content, getting employee participation and engagement, setting the right tone. Um, so all these enablement activities internally are extremely critical as well. Um, and it's, it's also really exciting for me to see um, where we are in this stage of our Nexus community launch because all of a sudden, all these employees are coming out and they're like, hey, you know, can we do this or can we do that? And so people are seeing um, the possibility, the the concept of of and, and, and starting to connect the dots with how it benefits not only their um, their work day and the things that they do for the company, but the larger company um, and and our customer base. Now, that's often how the way that I measure the health of communities that I'm on are is this an idea hub, right? Is this a place where ideas are, spring easily from? Are they shared? Do people interact with them? And so, yes, joining, being active in the community and uh, incorporating your own ideas and then just really interacting with the others really does seem to be the measure of the health of a community. So, Sarah, now, you know, we're in the process here of, of the community kind of being in full swing. And, and there's a lot of communities that are kind of in that state, right, where things are starting to spin up. Um, there's a lot of staff involvement to, to make that happen. How do you know when to pivot, right? The pivot could be you're, you're going to tweak some things about how the community works or what sort of things you're presenting, or maybe you're, you're pivoting to a more, uh, you know, customer or member driven side of the community rather than more of a staff driven side. How, how do you know when to do that? How do you do that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are so many different dynamics to a healthy community and to making sure that you are uh, providing value. Um, so I think best laid plans, right? Um, right. You always want to make sure that you have structure, that you're, you know, that you're going back and you're measuring and you're making sure that, um, that you're meeting the needs of the organization and your customers. Um, there are many situations where you will map out a program or a launch or something. And, and I think we've all been a part of this where all of a sudden the dates change or there's some other factor that comes into play like, oh, we're doing a rebrand next month. <laughs> you know? I mean, not with this company, but I've had that happen in the past. Um, and so you kind of have to pause for a second and say, okay, what's the backup? You know, how do we best execute on this? Um, and how do we, uh, you know, make this the, least disrupt, disruptive uh, situation for our community members. Um, I think that community is a, is a big differentiator uh, between you and your competitors. Um, and the, the sentiment and the tone and the value are all critical pieces. So it's always important to, to make sure you, um, that you have your backup plans and that you are listening and that you um, make sure that you continue to execute and move forward on uh, what your goals are. Yeah. <laughs> so adapt, improvise, and overcome. But, <laughs> uh, well, Sarah, it's been great talking with you. We really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us and, and teach us so much. Uh, if people want to reach out to you, is the Nexus community the best place? Absolutely. And you can find the Nexus community in a variety of ways from the website, the URL, sciencelogic.community.com. Or you could just run a search on one of our products um, and you can go right into a discussion thread. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, please hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and many other platforms. We release new podcasts on a regular basis. If you'd like to see more podcasts, you can always go to sciencelogic.com slash podcast. Thank you.